afternoon. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming to the Indiana University Maurer School of Law Tax Policy Colloquium. I'm Professor Leandra Letterman, and I run this colloquium, which, as I've mentioned to most of you, is in part a class for law students. So um, Professor Tina Urkabel is professor and head of the Department of Tax and Fiscal Law on the Faculty of Law at the University of Katz in Austria. She has her master's in law from the University of Katz, including one academic year abroad at the Université de Paris 10 Nanterre with a specialization in European law and French and international law. And she also has her Juris Doctor from the University of Katz. Her comparative dissertation work included several research stays at the Université de Paris, in, the Sorbonne, and she joined the University of Katz as a research associate in 1998 and became a lecturer there in, 19, in 2007 and a professor in 2009. And she's also been an employee and then a partner of BDO Katz. Her main research areas are tax procedure, Austrian and European value added tax law and constitutional issues and taxation. And today she's gonna to speak to us on her paper, um, Big Tax Brother Watching You. So with that, Tina, I think you wanna share slides, correct? There we go. Can you all see my slides? Yes. Yes, okay. So thank you very much for the invitation. I would have preferred being physically present, but I'm so happy, Leandra, that you, you managed to make that kind of online um, or on life um, <laughs> seminar. Yes, um, I'm going to talk about a topic that is um, one of my well, heart topics or has been being one of my heart topics over the, the past three years. I talk about big tax brother watching you and defining the lines between efficiency and taxpayer rights. A first version of and a long version of what I'm going to talk about, it has been published in a book that um, has been edited by Werner Haslena and Katharina Pantazau. Katharina is present today, as far as I've seen, and Werner has talked in this tax colloquium a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I'm very excited about um, talking about, or about talking about what, what my new topics or my new thoughts on the issue. And to start, I just want to remind all of us how um, the internet and data collection affects our lives. What you see uh, here is the cover, the front cover of one of the, I would say, one of the most innovative um, magazines of economy in, Austria, in, in, in Germany. It dates from 2019. And I just translate what you see there. It's Alexa, please tell my fridge that he, it tells my TV that it tells my lawn mower that it asks my smartwatch what time it is. And that should just remind all of us how much we're connected to the internet and how many different devices are just collecting data and processing. And then there are people behind or companies behind which process our data and make something of our. Uh, what if tax authorities, and now I, I would love you to think about with me about the question, what would happen, what happened if tax authorities had access to all the data we leave on the internet? And if tax authorities were entitled to process these data in order to ensure our tax compliance? And um, the idea might sound dystopian to some of you, but in the next couple of minutes, I will show you that we're not far away from it and not far away from both from using big data analytics to ensure enforcement uh, of the existing tax laws. And if some of you have heard the talk given by uh, Professor de la Feria a couple of weeks ago, then she was presenting a paper where she at the very end um, said that, well, VAT would be fairer if we would um, erase or we would abolish any different tax rates or tax exemptions, but grant um, transfers via individual transfers um, and, and, and this can only work if we use data analytics for that. Um, and what, would, what happened if tax authorities had all these data? And then for sure tax enforcement would be efficient, probably at, at more efficient than now and if the data analytics worked well it would be efficient at maximum and in the best case tax evasion would maybe be impossible. And paying taxes could become very much more comfortable because imagine having 
you know, kind of a bracelet or having your, um, your smartphone uh, collecting all the data, everything you do, all your payments. So there wouldn't be any cash payments anymore, probably. But just allowing tax authorities to, to, to see everything you do in your life and then to kind of automatically um, collect the tax. This vision is not really, um, it seems strange, but if you read papers which were issued by the OECD, the International Organization of Economic um, Cooperation, then you will find out that one of their visions is to render tax paying almost invisible to the taxpayer by using new technologies. And the question I want to discuss with you is if this would affect personal autonomy and if there's a reason to be afraid of. And well, and this is of course enshrined in a much broader question, the question if we still need personal autonomy, if we take into account that the tech industry already knows everything about us and that we deliberately accept um, to constantly being matched and even manipulated. And then um, the other issue is to, um, that it seems that um, policymakers very often say that we need, all need these technologies because there is no other way to eradicate tax evasion. And then, well, there might be the further question whether we really need to eradicate tax evasion or whether a liberal democracy does not need to accept a certain degree of um, non-compliance. Yeah. And just to show you that um, my idea of talking about the question about tax authorities and data mining and, 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 and this kind of surveillance um, is not something that just came out of my mind. Uh, on this slide, you see um, the sources of big data and the source of that slide, well, that picture is the Russian Federal Tax Service. Now, you might think, well, Russia is not considered to be a liberal democracy. I totally agree. But what is, um, I did not get this, um, this, this figure um, from Russia, but from an OECD study. So that means and the OECD has members which are liberal democracies. And in that OECD study, um, they um, promote the use of big data analytics in order to, to um, enforce tax laws. And so if you, if you look at, the, at this picture, then you see all these kind of sources of information, of sources which could provide information to tax authorities. And then um, having another look at another figure that can be found in different studies by the OECD, you see that disruptive environment surrounding revenue bodies. And if you have a closer look at, the, at these rounds, you will see big data here and advanced analytics, real-time analytics, big data in order to, enforce, to, to, to foster compliance. And you find all, all these kind of um, tools that are used by private companies in order to, well, to, allow targeted advertising and all kind of at least nudging when not if not manipulation of consumers so the idea could be to use that for tax purposes um before i start um talking about the legal issues i see in this i, I just want to make sure that everyone knows what big data analytics is about and big data analytics is when we talk about big data, there are three um, elements. It's volume, velocity, and variety. That means big data analytics is our algorithms that can proceed, process high volumes of data with a high velocity and a large variety of data. So data from very different sources. And um, the particularity of these algorithms is that what they can do is cannot be done by a human, by a single human brain. So they're much more performing than a single human brain. And that means that a big data analytics tool is not to be compared with a single tax officer who normally in traditional times um, did um, deal with tax, um, with tax returns and every tax issues. And when we look at the data that data analytic, and the analytics can use, it's two kinds of data and everyone needs to be aware of the fact that there are two kinds of data, it's not only the volunteer data. So whenever we agree um, on the internet to, to, to our data being collected, it's not only the volunteer data, so the data that we deliberately disclose, but it's, the, it's also the observed data. So that means that 
these data collecting machines can capture data by measuring online click clickstream behavior, the location and mobility data, so geolocalization can be um, used. And in the way we look at our screens can um, provide information to, to these machines, which then allows these machines to kind of create our digital avatar. So they, can, they might then uh, discover patterns and know about our subconscious um, behavior much better than anyone else who would just look at us. And, um, and then, and that's important too, and I'll come back to that a little later, is that these analytics tools can be either rule-based algorithms, which are not that much a problem because a rule-based algorithm is an algorithm that has been coded by a human in a very restrictive way. That means that the human, be, the, the human who coded the, the algorithm told the algorithm that under a certain condition, a certain consequence needs to be taken. So it's the if, when, ordinary um, coding. But of course, such a coding is not, would not be very efficient with a high variety of data. And that's why machine learning is very important in big data analytics. And with machine learning, they're based on neural networks. That means machine, machine learning algorithms are able to find their own patterns. So they're not fed by rules, but they, they have predefined sets of uh, predefined code, but then they develop furtherly. And um, for machine learning, we can distinguish between observed machine learning and deep learning. And to be sure, to, to, to make sure deep learning is not observed by a human being. That means that um, there is no control over the code and no one can afterwards find out how a certain result issued by such a machine uh, was, um, was reached. And that's why I, um, I believe that deep learning algorithm cannot be used by tax authorities at all. And I, when I'm talking about machine learning in, 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 the, in, the, in the upcoming couple of minutes, I only talk about observed machine learning. So just to, I just skip this, just to work, give you a quick look to see how, um, how machine learning is part of artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence is then something in on top of machine learning. And then this um, shows a little bit how you get to, to data analytics from raw data to then um, specific um, outcomes. So sorry, can you see what well, Yeah, okay. And uh, so what are the legal issues I want to talk about? Um, first of all, um, we live in a society that we live in, hopefully will be still living in a de liberal democracy after all this time of confinement. Um, and I, I, I firmly believe that liberal democracies are, are the way uh, to give, a, well, a happy living to people. And liberal democracy, the DNA of liberty kind of, um, yeah, is human dignity. And human dignity is, um, is ruined by individual autonomy. That means the individual in a liberal democracy is considered to be free, to have a free will and to be able to take rational decisions. And rational decisions means too that um, we presuppose that individuals are able to take responsibilities. That means that individuals um, know that they need to comply with the laws, but in case they do not comply, um, they, they take the responsibility. So that means that liberal democracies protect the individuals against ubiquity and online science of the state. So one of the, the very important parts of a liberal democracy is that we assume that, state, that the state is not entitled to know everything of our personal lives. So liberal democracies, I think, accept a certain degree of defaults. That might be something that we can discuss later on because it could be that we just accepted the defaults because we were not able to, to properly enforce the laws before the rise of these technologies. Well, but of course in liberal democracies, individual autonomy is limited as far as necessary for the proper functioning of society. Now, um, let's assume that um, we, a tax authority of a certain state would want to, uh, wanted to, to, to use all the devices and 
everything that is used by the big tech uh, companies in order to control taxpayers. Are they entitled to think about that? Or should they just use their traditional uh, instruments? So um, I believe that technology, since technologies have um, evolved, uh, tax authorities are of course obliged to, to think about redefining their, their enforcement. So we cannot um, ask tax authorities to stay in their traditional way of enforcing tax laws if they're new instruments. But when we want to apply new instruments, we need to, to, to align these instruments with the, the core ideas of liberal democracies. And in this regard, there are four questions that we, we, we can address. And the first one is which data should tax authorities be entitled to, to, to collect? How should they entitled to process the data? How should they entitled to collect the data? And for which purpose should they use the data? And um, in order to, yeah, in, you know, I, I will think I'm probably um, jump to the, to, the, to the last slides, but just for the wage data, in traditional tax enforcement, taxpayers provide the data by themselves, and then there might be third parties providing data. But if we use the new technologies that we could um, source data from different other sources, all these volunteers and, 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 um, and um, observe data, which would not come from trusted parties. So um, if tax authorities could source their data everywhere, then we would need to, well, to, 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 to think about the accuracy. And then if, you must think about a big, big data uh, analytics machine as it, that, well, it, it, that improves with the amount of data it has at its disposal. That means that normally big data analytics um, tools do not erase data after a certain time. So they're fed, they're constantly fed by, fed by data. And then they make certain, they, they create patterns out of the, these data. And so if the taxpayer data of every, any taxpayer data get fed into the system and stay in there as long as they, the machine is working, then that might be a problem with, from a perspective, from a legal perspective of, of, of seeing that the taxpayer is entitled that his data get erased at a certain moment. Um, so I go to this, um, these slides because the, the other ones are just, would be the introduction, but I think that we can can have a look at this that way too. So in a traditional in a traditional um, setting, the taxpayer um, files his data through a tax return, and then very often there are third party reporting. But these third parties are trusted parties like banks or um, employers or even um, I don't know notaries or lawyers. And then there is a tax officer who is in charge of the of the tax act of a certain person, and that tax officer might have to talk to other tax officers but it's a person and this person looks at the taxpayer data which were filed and the tax party reporting and from this and his personal experience which he might have from other taxpayers too he decides on whether uh, to audit a certain taxpayer or not because one thing comes for sure uh, since taxation is a mass phenomenon and tax authorities resources are restricted there is no way to control every taxpayer. So that means that even now in the traditional scheme, tax authorities need to make a choice and there, there are some taxpayers who get less controlled than others. And then uh, the, the tax officers decides whether to audit the taxpayer or not. Um, if we replace the tax officer by machine learning, and I do not want, really want to talk about replacement in its proper sense, but because um, at the end, probably we still need a tax officer. But if we, let's assume that we take a machine learning device that supports the tax officer, then this machine learning device is able to, to, um, to cross check these data, all the data, these traditional data with other taxpayer data at the much higher scale and for a much, at a much quicker at a much higher scale and for much, for many more taxpayers. Um, 
are there any issues then? And one of the first issue is, of course, when you start cross-checking with other taxpayer data in a systematic way, and not only from a human brain's um, perspective, then there's a question about confidentiality. If, because, um, well, even though uh, you could kind of anonymize these data, with a large amount of data, you always are able to, to get the track to a single person. So um, a legal setup, or legal frame setting up machine learning as, as a tool for tax authorities would need to take, a, take into account confidentiality. And then there's another issue which concerns the machine itself, and that's um, opacity. Because, um, you know, this is a, an algorithm which creates its own patterns by the data it gets feed, fed with. And no one officially knows how this, uh, this machine, this algorithm has been set up. Because um, you could, of course, that's what others do. You could uh, render the, the code transparent, but a transparent code would probably um, not obtain, achieve the aim, because um, it would allow taxpayers to again cheat the system. So uh, machine learning from, for tax, uh, tax administration's machine learning by itself would be opaque. And then there's the problem, you need to take any measures to make sure that there is no bias within the machine. So assume that the tax officer um, or the, the, the coder of the machine is biased in some way. So it doesn't like, I don't know, women. And then um, of course that could feed into the code. And if there is no control over that code that could raise serious concerns. concerns. And then there's another phenomenon which is called automation bias. That means that people, individuals, tend to trust outcomes by machines, even though they, if they, they thought about it rationally, even if they, they seem um, not, they, 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 they don't seem um, appropriate. And so you would need special training for, um, for tax agents in order to question the outcomes given by a machine. And um, I've been thinking a lot about the question how to how to compensate this opacity that we probably need in order to to assure uh, proper enforcement um, with with the need of knowing how the machine works. And I think that the only thing that we could do is first of all that there would need to be a clear legal framing of how to set up machine learning for tax authorities then the, the, the coders would need to be people who know about the fundamental, fundamental values of a society. And there would need to be some sort of control. And that kind of control could be, could be established by procedural regularization. That means you need a proper procedure in order to set up a machine learning device for tax authorities. And probably it would need to be the tax authority itself to create that machine. And second, there needs to be someone who has the right to control the functioning of the machine. I don't know whether it could be a judge or someone else. It, for example, in Austria, we do have, we do have algorithms which um, do certain traditions, but we do not have any legal rules for their setting up. And if someone challenges the outcome, uh, no one knows what's going to happen. I ask judges whether they would check the functioning of the algorithm and they said well how could we do and they yeah okay and then there would need to be assured that it's not the machine who selects for audits it's only the machine but there's always a tax advice, a tax agent in between because we need to think and to take into account that any taxpayer has the right to due process and due process needs to make um make decisions understand understandable yeah so but what if then um tax authorities would included um new tools into enforcement and that would be tools of the internet of things and um one of the most um common tools of the internet of things which is already being used by some countries would be an electronic cash register so imagine that any taxpayer who, um, who, who sells goods or services for cash would get obliged to use a certain electronic cash register and would be obli obliged to 
connect this electronic ca cash register to the tax authorities. So that tax authorities could have um, real time online connection and access to that electronic cash register. You can think about the same with regard to the books of a company. Um, is there a problem then or um, another problem? And the issue is then, of course, do we um, approach a, a situation of surveillance? And this, in my view, depends on the, the kind of internet of things that is, going, is being used. So if you think about the electronic cash register, first of all, well, of course, any taxpayer using that electronic cash, cash register would need to use it in order to get, to give the tax administration really information on what's going on in his, in his, shop, his shop. And then second, it's just a cash register. It's not a steady surveillance of anything you do, but you can kind of go ahead with your IOT and think about the smartphone tracking any of your movements or your payments on your bank account by just saying, well, anything you do in your life has a tax relevance because, or almost anything, everything you do. Because if you go around and go to a shop to buy something, then at least in Europe, there are a lot of consumption taxes on it. If you sell something, something that's a question of, of income tax, or even if you drive your car somewhere, it might be a car's right for professional purposes that you might want to deduct the expenses. And so I do have the right as a tax authority to get, um, to get this information and then to evaluate whether this is a private or a, a professional expense. Um, so I think that using the Internet of Things would be a, a way to allow, um, to improve enforcement if it's used with care and then so electronic cash registers seem quite wise to me, but a, brace, a tracking bracelet, for example, or a tracking app on your phone would be a huge problem. And, and with that surveillance issue coming into, onto the scene, personal autonomy is of course much more effective than, than in the other areas. And then there's the last point, it's almost the last point, it's internet monitoring. So, and that's something that ha is, har is, is largely discussed in Europe. So the question whether tax authorities are entitled to do internet monitoring. So um, everyone would probably agree that a tax officer dis who decided to, um, well, to, to, to control a taxpayer uh, would be entitled to, to look on the internet in order to see what this person shows on the internet officially. And there is, um, there is um, case law by the European Court of Human Rights saying that internet monitoring, as long as it's not structured, is like, you know, watching people on the streets. It's the internet is a public sphere, it's public space. So you, everyone who discloses information in this public space needs to accept him being watched. But this it holds true for, for a single tax officer. But if we apply a machine, if we, we let an algorithm systematically and constantly, you know, go that in order to find out uh, what people do and in order to detect maybe tax non-compliance, then this is something different. And for this, of course, you need the legal, clear legal rules. Um, and some states in Europe have started setting up rules, such as France, for example. I saw that Professor Stankiewicz is there too, so he might have a comment on this later on. Um, and others do it without having any clear rules on it. But this, of course, uh, so constant internet monitoring would, would get very close to surveillance and affect personal autonomy in a, very, in a, in a dangerous way. And then there is the last point and that's social network analysis and clickstream analysis. So what if tax authorities apply kind of set up state cookies on our internet in order to um, analyze our, our behavior in social networks or our clickstreams? That could be easily done and even without the taxpayer knowing about it. And that, of course, would allow tax authorities to kind of create a digital avatar of us and find out what our, what our preferences are. Or, for example, seeing on the social networks that a certain taxpayer um, has risky hobbies and another one is, goes to, 
takes holidays always at the, at the same place every year and um, is very risk averse. And from this, you could, of course, um, deduct um, or you could assume that a risk a risk taking person will probably also take risks with regard to taxation. And then you could think about, well, um, uh, take more targeted action against this specific taxpayer than against another. And um, this kind of analysis would come close to secret surveillance. And secret surveillance is absolutely illicit in our liberal democracies, unless it is for the sake of um, fighting real severe harm to society. According to the European Court of Human Rights, and I, I must apologize, I don't always talk about Europe, but well, as a European, I, I, know, I, I know best about the European standards, but I think that these standards um, sort of apply in, in the United States as well. So um, in European standard, um, fighting terrorism, of course, is, um, would be a reason to, to apply secret surveillance measures. And I would, I would be interested in knowing by you whether you think that terrorism is, or tax evasion is as harmful as terrorism, because I sometimes have the feeling that international organizations and some of these NGOs just um, put tax evasion on the, at the same level as terrorism. And from this, there is a form of rhetoric coming up that tries to justify all very restrictive measures in tax enforcement the same way as they're uh, justified with the fighting of terrorism. And I think that's very dangerous. Yeah. And then if we go one step further, it's just for audit selection that I, I talked about audit selection. So, but, so tax authorities might use all these analytics either to, to, to select taxpayers to be in control. If the aim of, of using machine learning to, 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 um, is to, to sort out my control cases, then with the proper legal framing, I think it would be, it would work, but you need a legal framing and you need to be very much aware of, of the, the implications. But about, you need to be aware of, of, of the fact that technologies can do a lot and that you need to code the technology in a way that it, that's in line with, with, um, with fundamental rights and that you cannot just free the machine to do what, they, what, um, what it does maybe in the private sector. But, um, well, if this kind of learn machine learning would only be used for, were only used for audit selection, then it would probably not be very efficient because it's, it takes a lot of money and time to set these kind of devices up and tax authorities. And you can read this again from the, from the OECD studies. And um, there's an example from Austria where we have a predictive analytics competence center at the, Europe, at the Ministry of Finance. So if you look at this, um, then uh, tax authorities use these tools in order to predict taxpayer behavior. And then the future, one of the visions is not only to predict taxpayer, but to preempt taxpayers from misbehaving. And that would be mean that according to the data analysis, which has been done on you, tax authorities would try to find out whether, for example, you're risk averse or risky person, and then segment taxpayers in different groups in order to address them differently. And that could to be more practical. Um, that could be, for example, um, that tax authorities might decide that to, to, to find, and, and there's another slide which I want to show you, sorry. Um, this is this one. Uh, that's the risk differentiation framework. It's again a slide which is from the, the Australian tax, um, um, tax authorities. And if you look at this risk differentiation framework, then you could kind of segregate the taxpayers into four groups in high risk to low risk taxpayers. And then you could apply different tools of control to these different taxpayers. And now the question is, is that something which is in line with our, with, with our concept of personal autonomy? Or can I, can I just according to the, the, the past behavior of a person, um, uh, segregate these persons from an equality perspective and, uh, and use different tools? Or, and I again believe, yes, you can, but 
<laughs> you need a legal, clear legal frame, legal framing, and that clear legal framing must mean a taxpayer must have the right to know why he's such a supposed to be a high risk taxpayer or low risk taxpayers, and he must be assured that um, that that the data that that led to this differentiation are ac accurate. That means you need legal remedies, and then of course, um, and that's. This is again a problem because if I'm told that I'm a low risk taxpayer, the consequence might be that I get um, incentivized to cheat the laws because I know that they would not look that closely at me. So you would need again a, a huge set of other measures to ensure that, that people do not get sure about what the, the algorithm told them. So um, for prediction, it seems um, to be more um, problematic and it's less problematic if you segregate people by law so that means that you set up a law different instruments but if you segregate people by Natchez and that's something that that's happening at least in Austria is that that you do not have a law but you you just use different different soft tools in order to address taxpayers then the question is whether where the line towards manipulation is um, is overcome, and that would again. So if you get manipulated, manipulated, you do not, you don't realize you're manipulated, and you cannot take legal remedies anymore. And and that's of course a, a big um, impact on personal autonomy. So um, maybe to conclude. I think, I believe that machine learning is something that tax authorities might have to apply even to, to think about because um, it's a new tool, it's a tool that could increase efficiency and effectivity of taxation, of tax enforcement, and we cannot stay with the old instruments of tax enforcement. But if we use that, we need to, to carefully think about how to implement it. And we always need to be aware of the fact that the technologies are have been created by human beings and that's us we the human beings who have to decide whether we want to use the technology and in which way we want to use it and only by the fact that it's possible to constantly um observe everyone without in a, in a way which seems not very intrusive because we do not realize being observed does not mean that a liberal democracy um really affords that constant observation and if we don't want that constant observation we need to take the measures and i'm i i want to have just a very short jump into another areas because th tax law is is a good example for state uh intervention and um and what i've been telling you has been in the well if you look at different OECD papers and then international developments, then that's that's kind of has been in the air for a couple of years, and is being applied in certain countries. And I told you, which is a liberal democracy, and where the rule of law um, is very highly, well, has been at least very highly uh, respected. We do have um, data analytics without any without any. Um, without any really good legal basis. And now what we face, at least in Europe, and is, and I don't know whether you're talking about this in the US too, is that we think about um, tracking people in order to, to fight the coronavirus. And that's the same issue as this issue here. It's even maybe worse because it's, it's getting, again, more into our private sphere, but it's just showing me that this is, an issue, this is an issue that we have not discussed enough about. It's just here, it's being applied by private companies and many, many people then think, yeah, since private companies apply all these, these mechanisms, why shouldn't the state Tina, do? Tina, and I'm I, just gonna interrupt I for a minute. Just, sorry, I've got a-, a Yeah, I just saw this my last sentence. I, I just, okay. um, I firmly believe that we need to discuss it and it's that it's our obligation as lawyers to, to be aware of the price we pay or we would pay if we just accepted 
um, big data, um, big data analytics without any restrictions in taxation. Thank you very much.